The following program is rated TV MALV. It contains strong language and violence. It is intended only for mature audiences. And now they've even added an encyclopedia. Awesome. I do my shopping at home. I pay my bills. And I can learn something new. Prodigy now has a 21-volume electronic... CBN's the only place to see Remington Steel. I'm a man who enjoys impossible challenges. It's one... This morning, an earthquake at 4.31 West Coast time. Strong, jolting, and rumbling, it pushed its way through th Southern California. I also have to warn you as we begin this special report that what you're about to see almost defies description, and some of you may not want to watch it. 39 people in one house, dead, and no one can explain why. This is the body of the 20th victim found, a minister from Fairway, Kansas. It'll take a long time to get things back in shape. Some feel they never will. The year is 2020. A woman and her husband move into a duplex, sharing the home with two other tenants, an elderly woman and her adult daughter. For the first few months, nothing seems out of the ordinary. In fact, they never see them, and not once do they interact. At least, until. This begins seemingly out of nowhere and appears to have no end in sight. Every single time they do this, their dog freaks out, causing their newborn to cry and causing the banging to only become worse. It's a constant back and forth dynamic and things are quickly spiraling out of control. The cops aren't doing anything, the landlord is no help. And so at their wits end, they take to reddit.com to air out their grievances and to seek advice. At 11.09 p.m. on September 13th of 2020, a Redditor named Peaches and Glitter ventures to r slash legal advice to make a post titled, Delusional neighbor bangs on the shared wall when our baby cries and nothing can be done about it? It reads the following. I live in a duplex in Washington State with my husband and my son, who is only a few months old. My father-in-law owns half the duplex and is renting it to us, and the other half is owned by an older woman and her adult daughter. My father-in-law has known the women for over 15 years and told us before we moved in that the daughter was mentally ill and had strong delusions on occasion that caused trouble with the previous tenants. The last tenants apparently had to get a civil anti-harassment order placed against the daughter but eventually moved out when the behaviors never stopped. Apparently, the neighbor accused them of kidnapping and abusing their children, and even abusing their dogs. My husband and I brought our son home a few months ago, and we didn't have any issues with the neighbor until about two weeks ago. She has begun banging on and throwing things at the walls when our son cries. She screams at us as well, but I usually can't hear what she's actually saying. You know, over the screaming baby and the two dogs going absolutely ballistic because of the banging. It's absolute chaos and it's made my postpartum anxiety so much worse. 
Every time the baby cries, I experience intense panic, waiting for the screaming and banging to start. We've called the non-emergency police line twice when I can't handle it anymore, and the first time they talk to her and she stopped doing it as often, maybe once every two days. Tonight though, she's back at it and worse than ever. The air quality is so bad right now from the fires that I can't let the dogs out for long to stop them from barking. And the barking makes the baby cry harder, which makes the neighbor scream and pound on the walls harder. The officer I spoke with says we can try to get a civil anti-harassment order placed, but he knew for a fact that her behaviors never stopped after the last tenants tried that, and he said his unofficial advice would be to live somewhere else. Is that seriously my only option? We can't afford to move, but I can't keep living like this. Unfortunately, this post went largely unseen by anyone online, merely generating 40 upvotes in just 10 comments. One user named Lifeguard Ill suggested that the neighbor was merely banging on their wall because they were sick of the noise she was making. She's an owner, so you can't do anything. Your best solution is to properly insulate the wall against sound. From the other point of view, having a newborn baby in a shared dwelling is really shitty to your neighbors from the noise. Just as much as you don't like the pounding, your neighbors hate your crying noises and dogs barking. Maybe your neighbors can't handle the crying anymore. You should really look into soundproofing or your neighbor could start calling animal control and CPS for all the noise you make. Stop blaming the neighbor when you're the one making all the noise. It's an interesting thought process. However, the perspective is entirely valid. They are responsible for half of this duplex and there's really not much they can do about their distaste for a neighbor. As a matter of fact, that was largely the sentiment of those who did see her post. There's nothing she can do. And the matter was left at that. My first post never got much attention, but the outcome was pretty wild. Short version. In October of 2020, my husband and I were renting in a duplex, where my father-in-law owned the half that we lived in, and a separate family owned the other half. We brought our son home from the NICU in August, and towards the end of September, the neighbor started to pound on the shared wall if she could hear him cry. The pounding escalated over the next two months. The neighbor bought a megaphone to yell through the wall and threatened to rip us apart. She called us child predators, and she'd yell obscenities and threats until 3 or 4 in the morning. The police were called multiple times, yet nothing could be done about it. One officer told us, I'm gonna kill you. See, it doesn't mean anything if I don't actually do it. The elderly mother hadn't been seen in several months, but requests for wellness checks were brushed off. The general advice that I got was that as renters, we couldn't do anything. It was also suggested that this was reasonable behavior since the crying baby was probably really annoying. Since my first post, we moved in with my grandmother for our safety. The neighbor ended up busting a softball-sized hole through the shared wall to scream at us and occasionally just stare at us. The smell that came out of the hole was indescribably bad. Our security cameras recorded her coming to my son's nursery window at around 2 a.m. almost daily, just staring and holding her cat. 
It took until the end of January for the police to be able to enter her property. And as it turned out, the elderly mother had been deceased since at least June, and the daughter had the corpse dressed in her Sunday best, rotting in a dead bolted bedroom. The news article said the mother died from natural causes, and the daughter was taken to an inpatient psychiatric facility. I would be remiss if I didn't state the obvious, that fabricating stories online happens all the time and is remarkably simple to pull off. In the current online landscape, it almost seems like fake stories outweigh real ones by a large margin, incentivized by online notoriety and the pursuit of upvotes. There was something about this one though that seemed eerily specific. The premise was haunting, yet it seemed entirely legitimate. In January of 2021, authorities in the city of Richland, Washington made their way to the home of Peaches and Glitter in response to their 911 call. While there, they encounter a disgruntled 45-year-old woman named Angela Griner through the hole she carved in their shared wall and immediately notice an overwhelming odor. Because of this, they request to be let in to ensure everything there is okay, yet Griner staunchly refused. For over a week, she wouldn't let a single soul in, no matter how hard law enforcement tried. However, what she was unaware of was that police were already in the process of obtaining a warrant, essentially permitting them access, regardless of her consent. By February 4th, their warrant's granted, and so Richland PD returns and forces their way inside. And as expected from the revolting odor, the corpse of Griner's mother, a 67-year-old woman named Claudia Kinney, was rotting inside their locked bedroom. She reportedly died from pulmonary emphysema and was believed to have been decomposing inside that home for nearly seven months. As stated by the OP, Griner was taken to an inpatient psychiatric facility, and since then, there have been no further updates on her status or whereabouts. The duplex, to this day, still stands, yet now bears a reputation forever haunted by the grim events that took place there. The story in its entirety drives home the fact that you truly never know who's beside you, who's across from you, who is on the other side of the wall by which you sleep. For months, this family was unknowingly going about their daily lives with the human corpse just feet away from them and completely unaware that their neighbor was living alongside it. At the end of it all, Peaches and Glitter just wanted a home for their family, a place their newborn could grow up happily. Yet, little did they know what they were getting into and what was waiting for them. sign. It 
It's evening in Polk County, Florida. A 76-year-old woman named Loretta Pickard is home alone, asleep on her couch. She had just undergone hip surgery, so she was unable to move. However, her evening was just like any other. It's dark, it's cold out, and her home rests in a tenacious state of tranquility. At 7 p.m., Loretta notices that something is wrong. The smell of smoke awakes her. However, because she's disabled, she's unable to check what's causing it. During this, her husband was away with their grandkids, so she was effectively helpless in place. Meanwhile, the smell persists. Something is on fire. And so, she grabs her phone, dials 911, and explains to dispatch the following. Now what is the address of your emergency? Pardon? Now what is the address of your emergency? Okay, tell me exactly what happened. I think my house is on fire. And I'm here alone and I'm on a walker. Okay. Alright, I have a couple more. I just have a couple of questions, okay? Okay. Alright, just to help the pair of my, or the firefighters. Oh, yeah, but okay, hey, so these, these questions are not going to delay paramedics in any way. Okay, what type of building is involved? It's a log house with a tin roof. But it's coming from the roof, I think. I don't know. Okay, I have help on the way, okay? These questions are not delaying uh, the firefighters at all, okay? Okay. Okay. All right, I do have some coming. All right, I'm sending the fire department to help you now. Stay on the line, and I'll tell you exactly what to do next. What should I do? Okay. okay, is anyone trapped inside the building? Well, I'm inside the house. I don't even know how to get out. Okay, all right, I have them coming as quickly as possible, okay? How many? It's just me. Okay. I mean, my husband's at the ball game, and I can't get him. I'll try his cell phone. Okay, exactly where are you located? Uh, no, inside the home. Exactly where are you located? Oh, right, inside now the home. I'm in, right now, I'm in the living room. The smoke's getting bad. Okay, if it's safe to do so, leave the building, close the doors behind you, and remain outside. Do not try to put the fire out. Do not carry anything. Do not carry out anything that's on fire. I couldn't, honey, if I wanted to. <laughs> I'm on a walker, and I can hardly walk. <laughs> okay. All right, well, I do have them coming to school. If you're stuck, okay, so let me know when you see them. Okay, where exactly is the fire? On the roof, I think. Okay, is anyone injured? No, I'm not anyone here. I'm not injured, but my eyes are full of smoke. As long as I can't get out the door. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, I have them coming, okay? They're coming as quickly as possible. Okay. Wipe some signs, okay? Okay. <laughs> This back and forth continues for 15 agonizing minutes. 
Yet for this entire duration, help never seemed to come. Nevertheless, the fire seems to be growing. Where is everyone? Oh, oh, I see fire now. Okay. Oh, yes, yes, they're here. They're there. They're there. They're there. I'm letting them know exactly what's going on, okay? They are there. Okay. They, I promise they are right there. It's just they have to uh, make their way into you, okay? Okay, but they better are on. <laughs> This sound, the sound of flames engulfing the Pickard home, continues for nine minutes straight, with the dispatcher reassuring her the entire time that help is on the way. Little did they know, though, that on the other end of the line, there was no longer anyone there to hear it. Loretta Pickard, in this moment and contrary to all assurances by dispatch, had perished in the fire. But for over half of this phone call, help was just a few short feet away. Firefighters were outside when she was alive and had every opportunity to save her, but didn't. That evening, there were unfortunately no fire hydrants anywhere near the residence, so the crew was left to utilize the reserves in their truck. Instead of putting out the house fire with Loretta trapped inside, however, the crew's captain James Williams used the entirety of the reserves to combat what he described as a forest fire behind the home. This, by default, nullified any potential of combating the blaze's origin, diminishing any possibility of saving Loretta. At all. In a case eight on your side has been investigating all year long. Loretta Pickard died in her burning Lakeland home pleading for help, but firefighters stood by and did nothing about it. Well, now her estate will receive the maximum amount of money allowed under state law. Eight on your side, Stacy De Silva reports from Polk County. Loretta Pickard's niece tells me the settlement does provide a bit of closure. Since the incident, the Pickard family has undergone a grueling legal battle against the county, as in the weeks following the fire, it's been revealed that James Williams would frequently take Snapchat videos while at the scene of house fires. And allegedly, the evening of Loretta's death was no different. Even further, it's been stated by bystanders that little to no effort was made to get inside the home either, 
effectively leaving her helpless and alone to endure one of the most horrific deaths imaginable. In the aftermath of this incident, the Pickard family has been given a $200,000 settlement from Polk County in response to their inaction. On top of this, James Williams has since been fired and a void of heartbreak, loss and despair has been eternally left in their wake. No matter how much money, how much action is and has been taken after this incident, nothing in the world can bring back a family member who lost their life during a moment of desperation. It was the day after Thanksgiving, a time engulfed in positivity. However, for the Pickard family, this day will forever be remembered as the last that they would ever spend with her. That fateful night, Loretta's husband James lost the love of his life. Their grandkids left a loving home that they would never return to. And their entire family had unknowingly sent their final goodbyes to their beloved grandmother that they would never see again. Do not hang around the restrooms. And if you see any of your playmates about to get into trouble, get help from a police officer or someone you know. You not only have to look out for yourself, but for the little children who don't know any better and can't understand that some people are sick in the mind. In 2018, a YouTube channel was born. It's named Vera Koroteva, and over the span of less than one year, they'd upload over 1.4 thousand videos to the platform. Within them, we're able to observe the inside of an apartment occupied by what seems to be a family. And to be honest, not a whole lot seems to happen. They spend a ton of time watching TV and lounging around. And at first glance, it seems like this channel might be nothing more than an archival page run by them. Now, this would make sense. However, there's one small problem. This isn't Vera's only camera. This channel, Vera Koroteva, is likely run by not the tenants, but their landlord. And they've got eyes everywhere. Taking a look at the details of Vera's videos presents some eccentric discoveries. For instance, their titles regularly reference names like Putin and Hitler, and often use incredibly abrasive language when referring to their residents and the police. Furthermore, in their descriptions, they can also be found going off about useless drunkards 
housing the disabled, and something about smoke. But out of everything, the video that really made me realize that something is off here came with their upload from the 26th of October, 2019. It's simply titled, Water Supply Repair. And at first glance, it seems ordinary. Upon translating the description, though, we find this. I'll be honest with you. I've tried to read through this multiple times to glean any sort of logical flow in their wording, but it doesn't make much sense at all. From what I could gather, though, Vera seems to be furious at a judge. They then go forth to discuss legal documents that I believe they requested, and then fantasize about killing them by cutting the judge's throat with a razor. It's incredibly disconcerting. And regardless if the tenants even know that they're being watched, what I do know is that they are, without a doubt, completely unaware of what's going on in these descriptions. For over four years, this bizarre channel has sat like this, completely untouched and unnoticed by the broader internet. With this, their backlog spanning thousands of videos are public, documenting complete strangers living out their daily lives without even the slightest hint that the very person who owns the building they live in is broadcasting them to the world. Today, Vera Koroteva stands as an eerie look into the incredibly bizarre behavior of a peeping landlord. It's an unsettling digital relic, hidden away inside the furthest confines of YouTube's darkest abyss. I have absolutely no idea what compelled this person to do this, and even more so, what caused them to abandon their project completely. If the upload rate wasn't enough, they appeared intensely dedicated to their cause, as not only were there security camera videos, but also uploads containing phone calls, conversations, and even trips to real world locations. With the language barrier stopping me in my tracks, though, unfortunately, deciphering any of this has been ultimately futile. By the off chance any of you watching can speak or understand Russian, I am incredibly interested to learn more about why this channel exists and what exactly they were doing. Who are these people? And why are they here? Why do the cops constantly pop in? And what are they looking for? Most importantly though, why the hell is all of this public? And who in the world is Vera Koroteva? for differential pressure situations. The key is to recognize them beforehand and make sure you are prepared to deal with them. Because when it's gotcha, it's gotcha.
Back in February, we discussed the unquantifiable horrors of the ocean. Earth's greatest enigma. An entire biosphere not made for us. One of humanity's greatest mysteries has always been exploring the far reaches of the deep sea. And in a way, much of what's in it is completely alien to us. The peculiar thing about the ocean is that it makes up the vast majority of the planet we live on, yet stands so painstakingly inaccessible to humanity. The potential for death, freak accidents, and disappearances are so exponentially high, all spawned entirely by the mere nature of the ocean's environmental medium. February of 2022, five divers are commissioned by a field trading company named Peria to perform maintenance on an oil pipeline. Located at Puente Pier on the western coast of Trinidad and Tobago, the 30-inch wide pipe stretches from an oil riser named Berth 5, 60 feet vertically down into the ocean, 1,200 feet away from it, and 50 feet back up to the open sea under another oil riser named Berth 6. It was meant to allow ships to transport their reserves to Peria's facilities on land for processing. However, by this point, this particular pipeline was sealed off and hadn't been used since mid-2018. That day, the five men on the job were Faisal Kurban, Kazim Ali Jr., Rishi Nagasar, Yusuf Henry, and Christopher Budrum and they were tasked with heading into an underwater, air-filled habitat at Berth 6, removing a steel cover from the pipe, removing an inflatable plug from inside of it, and installing a connector from the exposed pipe up to the main platform at the Berth 6 riser. At first, everything seemed to be going to plan. The crew makes their way inside the air-filled chamber and remove their scuba gear so they can effectively perform their work. While doing so, however, they notice that the inflatable plug sealing the pipe off isn't coming loose. No matter what they try, it appears to be stuck in place. And so, Kazim volunteers to head out to grab a tool to help with dislodging it. Upon heading back down to Berth 6's chamber, Kazim hands the tool off to one of his co-workers who takes another crack at dislodging it. But what they're unaware of is that by doing this, they're unknowingly opening the door to a gargantuan difference in pressure and would very soon find themselves in a dire predicament. Right here, in but a fraction of a second, all five men and their equipment are sucked into the pipe, 50 feet down, and over 120 feet horizontally through it. And without even a second to process what just happened, they are effectively trapped in a pitch black cell. 
underwater. Immediately, they scream for help. They have no idea what the hell just happened, but they're in excruciating pain, and they gotta get out of there. In the next few moments, they collect their thoughts and orient themselves inside the pipe. They explain to each other their injuries, who's behind who, and try to deduce which side of the pipe they're even facing. With hope quickly fading, Chris begins motivating his crew to try their hardest to get out of there out of that hell they're stuck in. And so, he proposes a plan to link hands with ankles and to inch their way out. It was a 50-50 shot that they'd be heading in the right direction, but at this point, it was one they were willing to take. With no light source, no breathing equipment, no sense of direction, they begin to shuffle their way forward. In the beginning, it seems to be working. However, they quickly realize that sections of this pipe head down to a lower depth and have collected pools of water and oil. Were they to continue their plan, they'd be making their way through fully submerged sections of pipe, a proposition that, with no knowledge of how long it would go on for, was undoubtedly horrifying. With this revelation, Kazim, Rishi, and Yusuf decide to stay back. It's a risk that they just can't stomach, and so Chris reassures them that he'll return with help and continues onward with Faisal by his side. In the following moments, Chris and Faisal encounter two scuba tanks lying in an air pocket. They equip them and make their way through fully submerged, extended portions of pipe. For a while, they were making steady progress. However, on their journey, Faisal had come to an inconvenient revelation. He is excruciatingly exhausted and informs Chris that he simply can't continue. Chris proceeds, onward and onward, not even sure if he's heading back to the correct opening. Nevertheless, he holds out hope as critical minutes blur by. Until he finally encounters the pipe's bend. He looks up, and it's open. In complete disbelief, he begins to bang on the pipe, screaming and pleading for anyone to hear him. And by a complete miracle, outside its opening are two rescue divers who open it up, drop a chain down to him, and ultimately, save his life. just one problem. Four men are still down there, still alive, and still need help. To his dismay, Chris is told that there's nothing that can be done about them. 
it's apparently too dangerous to send someone in there to get them, and essentially, all hope for their rescue is lost. In utter disbelief at what he's hearing, Chris even tries to head back in there himself, however, is ultimately prevented from doing so. For three excruciating days, the remaining four divers are trapped in that pipe, begging and pleading for anyone to help them. Little did they know, though, that nobody was ever coming. Help was never on the way, and the men were, effectively, left to die. As of writing, there's an ongoing legal battle between Peria, the Coast Guard, the contract company LMCS Limited that assigned them to the job, and the victims' families, each of the accused passing off blame and responsibility for their inaction to a different party. No matter what ends up happening, though, I can only hope that the victims' families are given justice, as according to every report available, it seems that little to no effort was made by the companies or Coast Guard to save them. At all. The incident that occurred on that otherwise ordinary day is one of the most haunting freak accidents one could ever find themselves in. What began as an ordinary job had out of nowhere morphed into three days of absolute hell. I cannot even begin to fathom the feeling of being stuck in the dark, inside of a claustrophobic chamber 60 feet below sea level, and even more so, bearing the apprehensive hope they all held out for help. That never came. spaces and family life. The Port of Call. Gulf Side Pool, Cable TV, Volleyball, and if you stay for at least three days, you receive a Vacation Club card with over $100 in valuable discount. Valuable discount. Valuable discount. Call now and ask about our special 49 <laughs> late at night, and a truck driver named Eduardo Cullen has just checked in to Super 8. Not what you need to hear. Then stay here at Super 8. Clean, comfortable rooms because we inspect them more than any major economy chain. Clean, friendly Super 8. All the room you want. His night is unremarkable. It's about as ordinary as you can imagine. He cleans himself up, makes himself a hot meal, and just a couple hours later, falls deep into a much deserved slumber. Well, that's what should have happened. In 
It's been two days, and Eduardo has not checked out. A security guard on duty is sent to check on him. However, a do not disturb placard adorns the handle and the room is locked from the inside. No answer. Eduardo, you in there, buddy? Still nothing. He's not there, but it's locked. Suspecting that something is off, the guard manages to unlock the door and make his way in. And at first glance, this room is oddly ordinary. On the floor, the blankets lie haphazard. On the table, a handbag, a bracelet, a scale adorned with the name George Martinez, and a photograph appear left behind. Yet, once he makes his way to the room's rear and towards the bathroom, what awaits him is completely unexpected. Hanging by a suitcase strap, a badly decomposed woman stares down upon him. And Eduardo is nowhere to be found. You know, you would think that this photograph would make this woman's identification a breeze. However, reality has been quite the contrary. Police have since connected her likeness with the woman in the room. Yet, to this day, her identity remains exactly how it's been from the day she died. She is unknown. Unidentified. A Jane Doe. After an autopsy, it was revealed that she had heroin in her system and had passed away by taking her own life. The evidence from the motel room, including the scale with George Martinez written on it, were their only real leads in tracking down her identity. However, frustratingly nothing ever came from it. No witnesses, no footage, not even Eduardo. It took seven entire years before Eduardo's family was contacted by police. And coincidentally, they claimed that he had passed away not long beforehand. Upon being shown this mysterious photograph, however, they revealed that they didn't recognize him at all. This is not Eduardo and they have never seen this man in their life. That day, an entirely new mystery was born. Not only was there ambiguity around the actions of Eduardo and this woman's identity, but now an unnamed male has entered the picture. As the years went on, leads on him were all but non-existent, and all they really had to go on was the connection to that scale. George Martinez was believed to be his identity. However, given how many George Martinez's are out there, tracking this guy down in the 1990s was all but impossible. To this day, 
This mystery remains completely unsolved. Barring one credible tip that authorities received in March of 2021, it's been rumored that her name was Becca and that she flew there from Los Angeles, California. Why she did this, who she came with, and how she wound up in a motel bathroom is still unclear. However, with the rise of the internet and breakthroughs in technology, perhaps someday, her identity can come to light. It is hauntingly mind-boggling that not a single soul on this earth has been able to identify this woman for over 30 years. Much like the case with Joanna Lopez, having such hard photographic evidence of someone, yet knowing absolutely nothing about who they actually are and what happened to them, is eerily perplexing. What took place on that fateful night may never be known. And to be honest, a lot of it doesn't even make sense. Eduardo was merely stopping for a place to stay. So how did he become so wrapped up in such a tangled web of mystery? Perhaps there was more to this story, something that he wasn't letting on. However, given that he's since passed away, that question will painfully remain unanswered. If you know of or recognize anything about this woman, I implore you to reach out to the Albuquerque PD with information. This is an absolute Hail Mary. However, someone on this earth has to know something about her. For all I know, this case might not go anywhere anytime soon. But keeping stories like this relevant and in the public eye, in my opinion, that is the key to closure. A neighbor with the grim secret. A life lost through an action. A peeping landlord spying on unsuspecting tenants. A claustrophobic nightmare. And a mind-bending mystery lasting for over 30 years. Tonight, you and I dove into five disturbing things from around the internet. It's been a long couple years, I know, but I promise you this series is back. Sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, thank you all for your love and support. Throughout the years, you guys have stuck by me, and that truly means the world to me. With that said, if you guys have any submissions for this series, any disturbing audio, footage, events, anything, feel free to submit them to the show's dropbox at dtfaisubmissions at gmail.com. Once again, that's dtfaisubmissions at gmail.com. Thank you all again for watching. I'll see you in the next one. I love you all. And good night.
Tonight's video has been brought to you by Babbel. One of the skills I wish I picked up on while growing up is speaking a different language. All my life, I've come across so many people who have, for example, spoken Spanish directly to me. However, I've never quite been able to understand them or respond in an appropriate way. And that's why tonight, I've partnered with Babbel. Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the world that is scientifically proven to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Their app is incredibly intuitive and easy to navigate. Straight out of the gate, you're set up with a customized learning plan based upon your own skill level and are provided lessons that are actually surprisingly fun to get through. Even better, they also have mini games you can play when you're sitting on your couch and need something to pass the time. None of it feels like you're taking a class, yet you're learning throughout the entire process. You know, they say winter is the season of learning. Just kidding, nobody says that. But what I will say is that you can get 60% off your subscription to Babbel by clicking the link in the description below. Thanks so much again to Babbel for sponsoring tonight's video. And more importantly, thank you all for watching. Like I said earlier, this video has been very long overdue, and I promise you it's not going anywhere. I've been restructuring everything behind the scenes, and all I gotta say is monthly videos are coming back to the Nexpo channel in 2024, so by the time you guys see this, there will be another video at the end of this month. So be on the lookout for that. I'm really excited. Um, Wow, I'm just, I just started rambling. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for your support. It truly means the world. Um, again, if you're still here somehow, uh, check out Babbel. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to go now. Um, I've been working way too damn long on this video. So I'm going to go. I'm going to go start the next one. I'm, I'm going to go do it. Here I go. I'm going. I'm going right now. Okay. All right. Seriously. Thank you guys. I love you all. And good night.